Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ron Tolchin. I'm the medical director for the Bathurst Spine Center at the Miami Neuroscience Institute, Neuroscience Institute and I'm uh, really pleased to present a case today that uh, has been intriguing to me over the years uh, as it kind of uh, recurs in the practice. And I wanted to make everyone aware of it if they're not aware of it, so, so start looking for this a little bit. So we're gonna start with a 61 year old uh, right-handed uh, dominant male with complaints of right upper extremity numbness and tingling over the last five years. There's some coldness in the fingertips according to the patient and pain in the right cervical paraspinal region. Uh, the symptoms are worse with overhead activities and a trial of physical therapy uh, seemed to aggravate his symptoms rather than improve it. Medications he's on is diclofenac, 75 milligrams BID, pregabalin, 75 milligrams BID, and that resulted in minimal relief um, for the patient. Notable findings on exam showed no atrophy or fasciculations, no edema or vascular changes, and there was some mild tenderness in the cervical paraspinals and a mild loss of range of motion in the cervical spine. In terms of special exam testing, uh, there was a negative tenels uh, at both the cubital tunnel and the carpal tunnel, a negative phalanx, and a positive AdSense maneuver of the right upper extremity. And if you're not familiar with that, we'll go into that. Um, on neurological exam, he had normal strength, bilateral upper and lower extremities, normal sensation and normal reflexes, um, and um, grossly normal, normal neurological examination uh, throughout the period. So if we look at some diagnostics, we look at a lateral view of the cervical spine here, and we can see that at uh, C5, C6, there are some degenerative disc changes. Um, alignment seems to be uh, maintained. Um, and if we look at the uh, T2 sagittal view of the uh, MRI of the lumbar spine, there's some degenerative uh, or some mild disc bulging at C4, 5 and C5, 6. And you can see on the axial views corresponding to those two areas that there's some canal narrowing. There's definitely some foraminal narrowing as well, particularly here on the left at C4, 5 and at C5, 6. But nothing that's outstanding, no large disc herniation. You might make an argument there's a small disc uh, bulge slash herniation, a little eccentric to the right at C5, uh, C6, but small. And there's uh, no cord compression or cord signal abnormalities here. So it's some soft findings, some degenerative changes consistent with his age of 61. We did an EMG and nerve study, which showed mild cervical radiculopathy uh, at the C5, C6 area. And then we did uh, uh, arterial Doppler studies uh, with provocation, which I'll get into during this talk. And it showed that before the test, there was good flow in the subclavian artery. Um, and then during the provocation, um, uh, there, was, uh, there was reduced flow through the subclavian artery. And provocation, AdSense maneuver, hyperabduction sign, and we'll go into some of these things. But during some of these maneuvers, there was a decrease in the flow of the subclavian artery. Now, when you order an arterial Doppler study, you need to make sure you order it with provocative, uh, with provocative maneuvers. But before I give it all away, uh, let's go through what we think would be a differential diagnosis. So uh, with a normal neurological exam, you should at least entertain cervical myofascial pain syndrome. Remember, he was uh, tender in the cervical spine, some decreased range of motion. And then with the uh, EMG findings, we can argue that there was um, cervical radiculopathy. And again, with the MRI findings and combined with the cervical spine x-rays, we could agree that that's certainly something to entertain. And that's most likely where most people would go on this would be uh, radiculopathy. But I want to really talk to you about thoracic outlet syndrome, the arterial form, and why this is important to consider, especially given the fact that we had um, positive arterial flow studies with uh, provocation. And that's not something that's routinely ordered. And in fact, it's uh, certainly uh, under um, um, uh, ordered uh, and uh, really unappreciated as a, diagno as a uh, diagnosis and um, as a workup and something that I, I look for. So we'll talk a little bit about thoracic outlet syndrome today. 
So generally it's a constellation of signs and symptoms that arise from compression of the neurovascular bundle in the area just above the first rib, behind the clavicle, and that's the confined space of the thoracic outlet. When we talk about the neurovascular bundle, we're talking about the brachial plexus and the subclavian vessels, artery and vein. It's more common in adults, and the rates of neurogenic thoracic outlet syndrome and venous thoracic outlet syndrome are approximately 25 and, 20, and eight per year in a metropolitan area of 1 million respectively, so not high, but certainly something enough that you don't want to miss it. It's Although it's somewhat of a rare disease, these numbers are not insignificant, and they're, um, um, they're actually lower than prior estimates uh, um, uh, in years past. So I'm going to look a, a little bit about the anatomy. We'll talk first about the scalene triangle, and that's the space essentially in, involved in thoracic outlet syndrome. It's the most common site of uh, brachial plexus compression, and I'll show you on the next slide. And then there's the costoclavicular space, just as the name applies, uh, implies. It's the area between the first rib and the clavicle, and the brachial plexus, subclavian artery, and vein pass through there. And then there's the pectoralis minor space, and that's bounded by the pectoralis minor muscle uh, anteriorly and the chest wall posteriorly. And the brachial plexus, subclavian artery, and vein also pass through that pectoralis minor space. So let's look at some of this. So if you look at my uh, diagram here, you could see the scalene anterior and medial scalene. You could see the brachial plexus in this top diagram to the left passing through that area. You can also see the subclavian vessels. You can see it a little bit better here um, in the middle slot, uh, the middle picture here. So this is the uh, scalene uh, triangle. So anterior and medial scalene, and then the brachial plexus and subclavian artery are passing through that area. Um, there's the costoclavicular, again, between the first rib and the clavicle, and you can see that all three structures pass through here, the subclavian vein, subclavian artery, and the brachial plexus. And then this is the pectoralis minor uh, right here on the right, and you can see that the subclavian vessels pass through there as well as the uh, brachial plexus. And you can see that with tautness of the pectoralis minor, there could be possible compression of those of the neurovascular bundle right there, again, bounded by the pectoralis minor muscle and the chest wall. This is the area on the top diagram showing the area of tingling or pain. Looks like median neuropathy. We should have actually put that in the differential as well, correct? So uh, you could see that there's an overlap of these constellation of symptoms. So the pathogenesis could be due to anomalous ribs. It could be associated with neurovascular compression or a fibrocartilaginous uh, band that's congenital and associated with an incomplete cervical rib or a muscle or a muscular anomaly. Pre-existing variations in the anatomy can narrow the space between the anterior and middle scalene muscles, or it could be due to injury. So chronic inflammatory changes due to trauma. Um, and uh, neurogenic thoracic outlet syndrome due to hyperextension or hyperflexion injury of the neck, such as in motor vehicle accidents. We typically um, think about whiplash syndrome in motor vehicle accidents where there's acceleration, deceleration forces or cervical radiculopathy, but we don't often think about um, thoracic outlet syndrome. With clinical evaluation of neurogenic venous and arterial thoracic outlet syndrome, those are the three types that you have. There's a compression of a specific structure, although there may be some overlap in symptoms if there's more than one structure affected. So a compression maneuver on a physical exam, such as the AdSense test, may demonstrate a decrease in the radial or ulnar pulse with abduction of the upper extremity overhead. But this test is prone to false positives. And if you look at the literature, it's really all over the place. It's not a very sensitive or specific test. So here are some of the maneuvers. You have the AdSense maneuver, the typical one where you're um, uh, palpating the pulse, uh, radial pulse in this case, of the affected upper extremity. You have the individual tilt their head and turn it towards the affected extremity. You can have you enhance this by having them hold their breath. What you do is you, uh, you would lose the radial pulse in this case, and the patient could become symptomatic. The reverse AdSense is to have them look away from the affected extremity. Um, and tilt their head as well. You could just do neck tilting, or you could compress down on the costoclavicular area, putting one hand on the shoulder with a downward force while you're holding the radial pulse. The hyperabduction test is shown here in uh, D, 
and that's for the pectoralis minor syndrome. So what you're doing is you're abducting and externally rotating the upper extremity. You're putting, um, you're putting some uh, stretch across the pectoralis minor. And if there's already compression there, it just enhances those symptoms. And then there's the ruse test, which is abduction in a military position, uh, abducted, externally rotated, 90 degrees, shoulder and elbows. And you have them open and close their, their, their fists for about three minutes. Now, I usually have a medical student do it along with them and see who uh, fatigues first. So if they become symptomatic or they, um, uh, they can't hold it for three minutes, they really get fatigued in their upper extremities, then that's a positive ruse test. It doesn't look very good if the, if the medical student fatigues before the patient, though. There's a lot of tests, really, and they've been tried uh, throughout the course. Um, you can uh, bring your hands up to uh, when uh, you can uh, you can do the adjuncts maneuver like I showed you, or you can have the hands out to 90 degrees at the sides. You can do an Allen test, hands straight up, hands 90 degrees. Um, uh, this is the costa clavicula right here, um, where you're pulling downward. Uh, on the shoulder girdle, compressing the clavicle on the first rib. Um, and then um, the Allen test where you're bringing it out to the side with abduction um, and then the hands in front. So there's lots of tests. And again, the sensitivity and specificity is variable. This is an upper limb tension test. So you have the patient have their arms out abducted to the side. And, um, and then you bring their wrists up at, uh, at 90 degrees and then you tilt their head to the side. And there was, there was a study out of the Journal of Vascular Surgery in 2007 showing some of uh, the features of this test and it's uh, one of the most sensitive tests. So in terms of symptoms, according to that study, neck pain was the most common symptom out of uh, 50 patients. So 88% of these patients had neck pain uh, I'm sorry, trapezius pain was actually the most common. Neck pain was uh, up there as well, shoulder pain and arm pain. And then paresthesias actually beat all of them with 98%. And it involves all five fingers, delineating it from, um, um, from um, carpal tunnel syndrome or cervical radiculopathy um, in at least half of those patients. But it can be variable, first to third finger, or actually no paresthesias at all, but that was rare. And then when you look at the upper limb tension test, um, that had a very high um, positive finding on, on exam and also the abduction and external rotation test. Um, but the, the other ones are variable. Um, just putting direct pressure over the scalenes can yield uh, radiating pain in 92% of these, uh, the study. So again, it's very variable. The symptoms, depend on uh, which of the thoracic outlet syndromes we're talking about. So in neurogenic thoracic outlet syndrome, the symptoms are pain, dysesthesia, numbness, weakness, and it can be localized. It doesn't have to be localized to a specific peripheral nerve uh, distribution. Um, symptoms are reproducibly aggravated by any activity that requires elevation or sustained use of the arms and hands. So I typically ask patients, uh, especially when they're women, if you fix your hair and you have your hands above your head for a while, you're blow drying your hair, your, ha your arms get heavy. And so that's one of the symptoms that they have. Now with provocation, neck rotation, head tilting, arm abduction, external rotation, or the upper limb tension test, you can bring out these symptoms. Um, there's, um, with long-term compression, there could be atrophy, more on the thenar eminence side, and some muscle weakness in the hand. And it's usually due to a taut congenital band from the first rib um, to an elongated uh, C7 spinous process. You can see the brachial plexus again coming out between the scalene anterior and medial here. The second most common um, uh, thoracic outlet syndrome is venous thoracic outlet syndrome, seen in 3%. So after vigorous repetitive exercises of the upper extremities with the, with the arms overhead, uh, it can occur. So people working out with their arms up over their head um, can bring this on. The symptoms are forearm fatigue, swelling, cyanosis, pain, paresthesias of the fingers. And then you generally will see this collateral venous patterning over the shoulder and neck and chest wall. Um, upper extremity edema is the hallmark of this. And you definitely have to look for venous thrombosis. Uh, one of the syndromes is um, Paget-Schroeder uh, syndrome. Um, or effort thrombosis.
you can see here the uh, subclavian vein um, coming through the re region between the clavicle and the first rib, um, and it gets compressed. Um, again, repetitive overhead activities, what brings this on. And you can get some, also some circumferential uh, perivenous scar tissue that can occur over time as a repetitive injury. And then thrombus formation with this collateral circulation giving you edema as well. And then um, they, they, they get this effort thrombosis. Arterial thoracic outlet syndrome is the least common type, about 1%. It can develop spontaneously unrelated to trauma, but it's usually associated with a cervical rib or an anomalous rib. So it can occur in young patients without any peripheral vascular disease or arterial disease. The symptoms are hand ischemia, pain, pallor, paresthesias, and coldness. And it can be due to thromboembolism from a mural thrombus of the subclavian artery or an aneurysm. Uh, it can also be due to subclavian artery stenosis or an occlusion. And there shows you the subclavian artery coming um, just uh, posterior to the uh, scalene anterior muscle along with the brachial plexus and also behind the pectoralis minor muscle. In arterial thoracic outlet syndrome, you could have a lower systolic blood pressure in the affected arm compared to the unaffected arm with decreased pulses. You can have signs of finger ischemia. You can, if you uh, listen, you can maybe hear a brewery or palpate a thrill. Um, there's usually no scalene muscle tenderness as opposed to the neurogenic form. And then the prov provocative maneuvers do not always elicit symptoms. For a diagnosis of arterial and venous, you have to demonstrate occlusion of the subclavian vessels. And then EMG you use for suspected neurogenic thoracic outlet syndrome, but it usually is negative, although we order it. Um, and again, it can be confusing if there's cervical radiculopathy. Now I've had patients that actually were diagnosed with cervical radiculopathy from a disc herniation taken to surgery and, uh, and not improved after surgery and we worked them up further and found that they had thoracic outlet syndrome. The scalene muscle test injection is an injection of lidocaine into the anterior scalene muscle and it relieves the symptoms and it predicts also success with surgical decompression. According to the Society for Vascular Surgery for Neurogenic Thoracic Outlet Syndrome, you need to have three of the four following. Signs and symptoms of pathology occurring at the thoracic outlet, signs and symptoms of a nerve compression, the absence of other pathology explaining the symptoms, and a positive response to a scaling muscle test injection with lidocaine. With imaging, you look for cervical ribs or a particularly long transverse process or spinous process um, or um, rib clavicular fractures, uh, perhaps evidenced by callus formation if it was a prior fracture. And about 0.5% of the population have cervical ribs, so it's very low. The absence of rib abnormalities usually eliminates the diagnosis of the arterial form of thoracic outlet syndrome. The duplex ultrasound is really highly sensitive and specific for venous stenosis or occlusion, but you need to have an experienced vascular ultrasound technician using positional tests. I generally send my patients here to the vascular lab at Baptist Maine at MCVI, um, and, um, and they have, uh, I've had 10 years of experience sending patients doing the provocative maneuvers. I specify on my order that I want the duplex ultrasound of the, art, of the upper extremities with provocation. For the arterial form of thoracic outlet, this uh, ultrasonography can demonstrate an increased flow velocity in the subclavian artery at the site of a stenosis or an aneurysmal degeneration of the artery distal to the stenosis. So you, look, you do an x-ray, you look for a cervical rib. In this case, there's a cervical rib coming off of uh, C7 where, uh, as opposed to starting at T1. The diagnosis, also you need CT angiography and venography to show central venous, uh, central uh, vasculature and extremity vessels. And you could do 3D reconstruction showing the point of compression. And you could do an MRA with provocative arm positioning, which is a very good tool. If you're concerned about the brachial plexus and the neurogenic form, you do an MR neurogram. And then arteriography may still be needed for patients who have signs and symptoms of acute arterial insufficiency or ischemia, or if there are plans for surgical reconstruction. Um, or if you do a catheter-based thrombolytic therapy with improved outcome. You can see here in this arteriogram that the, there's compression of the subclavian uh, 
artery right here. And then in this case, there's almost complete occlusion. Management depends on the type of thoracic outlet syndrome. So physical therapy is generally useful for the neurogenic form. You give them a trial of four to six weeks to strengthen the muscles around the shoulder the, and do postural exercises to help the patient sit and stand straighter, lessening the pressure on the neurovascular bundle. In a lot of cases with neurogenic thoracic outlet syndrome, the patients are usually hunched forward. They have this slouch posture and you wanna, get, you wanna use therapy to reduce that and improve their posture. You can do an interscaling injection of an anesthetic agent, and that would also help uh, relieve the, uh, the, the uh, muscle spasm. You can use steroids or botulinum toxin. They've all been used with neurogenic uh, thoracic outlet with success. These are some of the exercises, including scapular protraction, scaling stretch, pectoralis stretch, scapular retraction, deep neck flexors, working on those, rowing techniques, uh, in the prone position, shoulder uh, abduction and adduction, and then scapular elevation. And you can give patients handouts that can enhance this. We generally have, we have this in Cerner, by the way, thoracic outlet syndrome exercises. Um, in the management for venous thr uh, thoracic outlet, systemic anticoagulation with extremity rest afterwards and elevation. If there's subclavian thrombosis, you could, there, you could use catheter-directed thrombolysis within the first two weeks, and then anticoagulate them for up to three months. And then most will advocate a surgical decompression as early as four hours after thrombolysis to reduce the risk of reocclusion. And I've had one patient that's had this done for venous uh, form and it's fully recovered. Ischemia can be due to distal embolization from arterial thoracic outlet syndrome, <clears throat> catheter-directed thrombolysis, and that may be appropriate before surgical uh, uh, repair. So catheter-directed thrombolysis before surgery for the arterial form. Uh, with more severe ischemia, it usually re re uh, it requires a surgical embolectomy um, with or without intraoperative thrombolysis in conjunction with decompression of the thoracic outlet. And then acute ischemia of the upper extremity uh, can lead to compartment syndrome. So keep that in mind, and that might require an upper extremity fasciotomy. Um, indications for surgery. Thoracic outlet uh, decompression is indicated for symptomatic patients with either the arterial venous form of thoracic outlet syndrome who are not at high risk for surgery or selected patients with neurogenic thoracic outlet who have acute or subacute progressive neurologic weakness or disabling pain and paresthesias or who have failed non-operative therapy. Uh, in, in my uh, uh, patient population in almost 30 years, I, I probably have sent maybe five to seven patients for um, um, uh, thoracic outlet decompression. You have to send them to centers where you know uh, these um, vascular surgeons have done a lot of these cases. No one's done a lot, but you have to go to centers where the, a few centers in the country where, where there are skilled clinicians to do this. There are multiple surgical approaches, uh, including transaxillary, supraclavicular, and infraclavicular approaches. And really that depends upon the anatomic abnormality and the surgeon's preference. Uh, with venous uh, thoracic outlet syndrome, systemic um, um, anticoagulation with extremity rest and elevation, um, catheter-directed thrombolysis. Uh, I think I already mentioned that. Sorry, it's a duplicate. Um, okay, so this is the uh, rib resection. This is uh, taking out the first rib and the anterior medial scaling, fully decompressing the uh, neurovascular bundle in this case. The outcomes, there are different classifications. There's the Durkish uh, classification to rate uh, the outcomes of surgery and ranging from poor result where symptoms are not improved or they may be aggravated to excellent results where there's no pain and there's return to the preoperative professional leisure skills. There's the disabilities of the arm, shoulder, and hand known as the DASH score. And it's from zero to 100, 100 is maximum disability. And um, the success rate uh, for neurogenic thoracic outlet syndrome is quite variable. It starts initially at 91 to 93%, but over time it can wane down to 64 to 71%. Failure can also be due to other, other extern, extenuating circumstances, depression, chronic symptoms, work-related injuries, or a lack of uh, response to the scaling block. And there are different studies. And then the outcome on arterial thoracic outlet is measured by resolution of ischemic symptoms, improved quality of life and vessel patency. 
And, and that could be excellent to good in more than 90% of the cases. And in Venus, 95% of the cases with successful outcomes. So that ends my uh, talk on thoracic outlet. It's, I bring it up because I always keep this in mind with people that have these vague symptoms in the upper extremities. And I think it's important to at least consider it. It's uh, easy to do some of these quick maneuvers like the AdSense maneuver, the hyperabduction or the costoclavicular sign and see if they have symptoms that are reproducible. Of course, you wanna do other things like Phalans and Tenels to rule out carpal tunnel, Spurlings to rule out you know, things such as uh, cervical reticulopathy. Um, if we have time for questions, I'm happy to entertain them. And I thank everyone for their attention this morning. Yeah, I think we got time for uh, a question. I think the surgery for first rib resection is very morbid. Yeah, I've only had, I think, five people in 30 years. Yeah. But I've had to send them to Johns Hopkins or Tampa. There's a, a vascular surgeon in Tampa that yeah. I've used that I've had good results with. But yeah. it, not pe people around here don't do it very often. No. I'm open to hearing any other uh, of the uh, participants today, any experience with thoracic outlet syndrome and uh, your thoughts. Dr. Tolchin, I have a question for you. Yes. This is Robert Saxton. Thank you for yes. an excellent presentation. Good morning. I really appreciate sharing wisdom with us. Um, so what surprised me was if you had that significant amount of arterial compression, I was surprised that they had no fasciculations or evidence of that type of, of neurologic irritation. Is that is that an unusual finding, fasciculations with thoracic outlet syndrome? No, I mean, if you have if you have ischemia, you can start getting fasciculations. Just didn't see it in that particular uh, patient. That was actually not that patient's arterial study. So it was not complete occlusion like I showed you there. I just bring it up as a point, but um, you, you, have, you have a good point. With that degree of compromise of the artery, you would expect more findings. My patient didn't have it, but had some, um, definitely had some um, compression. I couldn't get that study for some reason. Thank you for your question. Okay, Ron, you wanna stop your screen share and then I'll sure. get on. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. All right. So I'm up next, I'm filling in. Um, for some reason, I can't find my mouse on my second screen. Ugh. Okay, minor technical difficulties. Hang on one second. Um, okay. I, I got it. Yeah, yeah it's, it's working now. All right, can you all see the slide there? Yes, we can. Okay. So this is, um, I'm a surgeon. This is a surgically oriented case. Uh, this was a 57-year-old woman who presented to a clinic with a new onset of headaches, bifrontal, diurnal, no diurnal variation, meaning it wasn't worse in the morning when she woke up. No history of seizures, personality change, no progressive focal neurologic deficit. So all these are negatives for the four common symptoms of um, tumor in adults. So headaches, seizures, personality change, focal neurologic deficits. So the only thing she had was new onset headaches. And then on a physical exam, optic nerve heads were full. Uh, and she was non-focal, no motor sensory deficit, uh, speech language functional or visual fields normal. So it's a non-localizing exam. And, um, but the concern is that she has new onset uh, headaches. So somebody did a non-contrast uh, MR scan of the brain, which reveals a multi-lobulated hyper-intense lesion in the region of the foramen of Monroe. And you can see on the contrast study that it looks about the same. Um, when the ventricles are large, lateral ventricles are big, third ventricle small. And um, you can see on the T2-weighted images that there's some little, uh, a small amount of transpenimal 
flow maybe over the frontal horns, not very prominent. The important thing is that the signal on the T2 weighted images of this lesion uh, is dark. Um, and so that has something to do with the, the expected consistency. So in this location, um, this was thought to be uh, evidence of, um, or consistent with a colloid cyst. Um, if it was dark on T2, uh, the consistency would not be liquid, but rather semi-solid like silly putty. So given the options and the presence of hydrocephalus, age and headache, um, patients and evidence to suggest that she had some mild elevation of intracranial pressure with full optic nerve heads, but no full-blown papilledema. The patient uh, was offered uh, surgical intervention. I'm gonna tell you what I did. And then, then what I'll do is I'll tell you what the options were. And so <clears throat> what we did was a, a approach um, to the right frontal horn of the lateral ventricle. And uh, this was a transcortical transventricular approach as opposed to an interhemispheric transcolosal approach. Uh, so here's the anatomy. This is the septal vein. <clears throat> this is the choroid plexus. Thalmal stripe vein is here. Caudate is over here. This is a small retractor holding things open. And this is the column of the fornix. So where is the foramen of Monroe? And where is this colloid cyst? So most of this colloid cyst is up under the column of the fornix, which makes this very difficult to remove with an endoscope. Imagine coming in with a scope and finding this uh, limited abilities. And I used to do what I called a double setup, meaning I tried endoscopic uh, removal first, but I eventually gave up on it. And I'll, I'll review some of the literature for you and, and to try and show you why. So it's safe to coagulate the septal vein um, the caudate vein um, and the uh, thalmal striate vein and the septal vein come together to form the internal cerebral vein, which is in the roof of the third ventricle lying between two layers of um, thin uh, pia called the tela choroidea. And the blood supply to the choroid plexus in here is from the posterior medial choroidal artery. So um, it's safe to um, divide the septal vein, which you do routinely. You can open the roof of the third ventricle on the uh, medial or superior side of the choroid plexus. And this is called a trans telar approach to the um, same as what you would do down on the fourth ventricle out laterally. So we coagulated the septal vein, got access, and here's the consistency of this uh, colloid cyst. Um, uh, not very suckable. Um, it's a little bit blurry, but this shows the anatomy here. So this is the internal cerebral vein. Septal vein has been divided. This is the caudate vein. This is the thalamal striate vein. Uh, better view. You can see how far back now I've gone in the roof of the third ventricle. So I've opened about a centimeter of the roof of the third ventricle on the superior side of the um, uh, choroid plexus. This is the posterior medial choroidal vein supplying the wall of the uh, colloid cyst. So uh, with microsurgical techniques, I can coagulate, divide this. Uh, the opposite internal cerebral vein is over here. This is looking through the telia, tela choroidea of the roof of the third ventricle, and you can see that it looks whiter. This is the floor uh, of, the, of the third ventricle as seen through the tela. And then this was the specimen. So it's about um, a centimeter in diameter. So complete excision of the uh, wall. Uh, patient had a good outcome. Uh, we did not do neuropsychological testing because it was very hard to get authorization for, but obviously we should. And um, excision of the wall reduces, we think, the risk of um, recurrence. So uh, do we operate on every colloid cyst that we see? The answer is no. And um, um, these these um, small benign cysts arise in the roof of the third ventricle when they're incidental discovered on imaging after trauma, for example, there's no need to intervene. And the results from Bruce Pollock and the Mayo Clinic uh, group in the early 2000s when they published a couple of papers on the natural history of college cysts showed that uh, incidental cysts have symptomatic progression of 0, 0, and 8% at 2, 5, and 10 years. So just like other tumors, if they're not symptomatic and you can't make the patient better, you should just observe. There were no cases of sudden death in almost uh, six years of follow-up. 
Uh, I've never seen a case of sudden death. I've seen a case of acute onset of coma um, in a young girl who was taking um, a variety of different drugs, ecstasy and all kinds of things, was discovered down on the kitchen floor the next morning, um, um, obviously had been unconscious. She was fixed and dilated, had a you know, positive drug screen. When we scanned her, she had um, evidence of hydrocephalus and diffuse anoxic injury. Uh, and she died of her anoxic brain injury more than the hydrocephalus. Uh, she did have a colloid cyst. Um, so the surgical approaches when um, therapy is indicated include endoscopic methods. You can use rod lens or fiber optic. Uh, the fiber optic uh, scopes can be uh, rigid or flexible. Uh, the rod lens scopes are always rigid. Um, if you choose a microsurgical approach, you can, the standard classic one is interhemispheric, transcolosal, transventricular. Uh, a lot of, it, it's basically surgeon preference, but I'm going to show you some of the morbidity related to the transcolosal approach, which relates to the, the, the parasagittal veins, which sometimes either get damaged or maybe taken in order to get access. Um, there's the interhemispheric transcolosal interfornoceal, which I would never do. I saw that done once during my residency and the patient had an extremely bad outcome. And then there's the transcortical transventricular, either transforaminal when the frame of Monroe is dilated by the cyst, or you can do supra, uh, a subfornoceal, which is supracoroidal or on the medial side of the choroid plexus and transforaminal. And that's what I preferred. And I'm going to show you what we proposed in terms of consideration of uh, surgical anatomy and, and risk factors. So what does the um, literature say? Well, there was the Italians were some of the first to use endoscopic methods for removal of tuberculum celli, meningiomas, um, uh, craniopharyngiomas, et cetera. And this early study um, over an 11 year period, 61 patients, 11 centers, you can see the data. Some of these cysts were really small. Mean hospital stay was not short. So this is supposed to be a minimally invasive approach and the average patient stayed seven days. Um, with the endoscope, what you see is the capsule of the cyst. You coagulate the capsule with a, either um, a, um, a, a small, small monopolar or sometimes bipolar electrode. And then you incise the capsule of the cyst. This all has to be coaxial to the trajectory of the endoscope. Uh, we tried putting in secondary ports which ended up in sort of a sword fight between the endoscope and the operating instrument. So I, I basically abandoned that, that was too complicated. And you can um, excise all of the capsule, you know, maybe about 90% of the time. I think that's high, it's probably more like 80. Um, residual um, colloid cyst capsule is a remnant in, in, in this case, in 60% of cases. And the recurrence rate was 11%, which is, not that great for a benign condition and morbidity was 3.2%. So um, in this paper by Fred Meyer and the group at Mayo Clinic, they looked at the difference between the transclosal and transcortical approaches. Transclosal is a more um, technically difficult, but for microsurgeons, very pleasing approach. It's the standard approach. You can do the patient with their head in neutral position, nose up, or you can do them with in 90 degrees with the operated hemisphere down so that gravity helps retract the brain, maybe reduces resistance. The advantage there too is that you get to use your forceps in the long axis of the um, interhemispheric fissures compared to when the patient's nose up, you're perpendicular to the interhemispheric fissure. So there are some advantages to that. Uh, the transcortical transventricular, everybody was afraid of it because of the possibility of inducing new seizures. I never saw in our 33 patients a post-operative seizure related to transcortical transventricular approach. I did use uh, seven days of prophylactic anticonvulsants like the severe head injury data suggested. Um, and so uh, Fred Meyer at the group at Mayo Clinic looked at um, a number of different approaches for third ventricular tumors and found that seizures attributable to surgery occurred in 8% of transcortical and 25% of uh, transcolosal operations. And the transcolosal approach carried a 4.4 fold increase in the risk of, of seizures. Uh, most patients had a, a functional excellent outcome. 
more than 90% of patients were operated on for symptomatic colloid cysts, and uh, that was the number of 34, and they had an excellent outcome. So I felt when this paper came out, I felt that I had been justified or validated in my choice of surgical approach. And then there was a subsequent paper by uh, MD Anderson looking at morbidity, mortality associated with transcolosal resection of the third ventricle. Now, obviously these are not colloid cysts, these are different types of tumors, but you can see that neurologic complications in 34% and veins were taken in 11 out of the um, 38 patients who were operated on via this approach. And it's presumed that taking these parasagittal draining veins is the reason why patients get into trouble either with venous infarction or venous hypertension or congestion. But there's no doubt about the fact that the, as you saw in the Mayo Clinic paper, the seizure rate is higher. So um, early on when I was at UC, I was the uh, gadget guy, endoscopic head mounted display systems, image guidance, made custom probes for peel away sheets, brain lab navigation system. And uh, we had 33 patients. Uh, most of the patients were the younger patients. We did an open procedure on because we felt that it was more likely that we could excise all of the cyst capsule, therefore reduce the long-term recurrence rate. For older patients, we started with an endoscopic transcortical transventricular, and we used what I call the double setup. This is a term taken from gyne onc surgery, um, where we have the endoscopic methods and then the microsurgical setup in the room. So if we needed to convert, um, then we could do it easily without creating a big problem with supply of instruments. Um, tips for the transcortical transventricular approach, image guidance, obviously ventricular catheter is a guide. That image guided stylet that you all see, I made that with Brain Lab back in the late 90s for a proposed study on endoscopic versus image guided placement of ventricular peritoneal shunt catheters. That study was never done, but thankfully the image guided stylet stayed. Um, you can, as we did yesterday for the uh, uh, left atrial meningioma, you place the a red rubber catheter into the ventricle with the image guided stylet, look for a return of CSF, cut the catheter at the surface, and then follow the catheter to the ventricle. I think what's important is that you sweep the white matter with a blunt dissector. You don't use the bipolar to melt the white matter. You don't use suction to remove tissue, because if you use these two techniques, then you'll always see a tract uh, on a delayed basis postoperatively. But if you just sweep the tissue aside, then the tract usually closes. I never had a subdural hygroma that required any treatment in any of these patients. Um, for the open approach, we use the suprachoroidal dissection, which I just showed you. And if necessary, it's, uh, you can isolate, um, coagulate, and divide the septal vein. Never saw venous infarct. Ask Robert Spetzler if he ever saw a problem with coagulating the septal vein. He said no. Um, and then at the end, we leave an EVD for a day or two. You can actually suture the pia together and I put a little bit of gel foam down the tract, wait a few minutes, then irrigate it and remove it. Um, and again, no subdural hygroma. So uh, this is the kind of setup that we use for the um, endoscopic technique. Head of the patient is here, scrub nurse or table with instruments, monitor at the foot of the bed, anesthesia on this side, brain lab to the left, right-handed surgeon. Uh, here's an example of me back in the day. Uh, using the image guided stylet navigation, brain lab watching it under real time through the middle frontal gyrus, passing the catheter here to the ventricle, as you can see. Uh, then we cut the catheter at the surface, then we bring in the microscope. When CSF is coming out of the, um, uh, of the red rubber catheter's old trick, you could put some bone wax in the end of the cut catheter and that stops the egress of CSF and keeps the ventricles uh, plump for you. So. Um, and then what you do is bring in the scope, coagulate. I don't do transsulcal because it's just, it's a little bit more bloody. And then I just use tiny retractors. I don't use a tube. This is a rote number four micro dissector. And I'm following, there you can see the bone wax in the tip of the uh, catheter. And I'm just sweeping a subcortical white matter away with the uh, blunt dissector until I reach the ventricle. Here's the ventricle head of the caudate. Open up, here's choroid plexus. Here's the uh, frame of Monroe with the cyst. Um, in this case, uh, we did the suprachoroidal dissection. Here's with opening of the roof of the third ventricle, I can finally see the 
the uh, cyst wall and capsule, we were able to excise it all and there's a hole at the end. And then on the um, exit, this is what the final specimen looked like, coagulated septal vein, the frame of the row is closed again. The column of the fornix looks in reasonable shape. Uh, this is the exit site, put some uh, flow seal or surge flow in here. Um, and if you coag, one of the advantages of coagulating the pee at the surface is you can use two uh, true jeweler's forceps, hold this together and actually put an absorbable suture in and close the wound over the uh, ventricular catheter. So uh, based on this um, experience, we proposed a um, anatomic consideration to different surgical zones for operating on colloid cysts. And um, zone one was not the, the back edge of the choroid plexus, but actually where the septal vein enters the um, internal cerebral vein, because you can divide, isolate, coagulate, and divide the septal vein at any point prior to its entry into the internal cerebral, preferably some distance away from the internal cerebral. Now, zone two is from that point all the way back to something called the medial atrial vein, which most neurosurgeons never see, don't know what it is. But if you actually open the, um, uh, the roof of the third ventricle along the superior medial side of the choroid plexus, you can go as far back uh, until you reach this medial atrial vein. You cannot uh, coagulate and divide this because this drains the entire thalamus. So if you did, you'd, the patient would be in big trouble, likely be fatal. And then zone three is behind the medial atrial vein. And this is basically the no-fly zone. Um, you can look back here with maybe an endoscope, but you can't uh, dissect this much um, any further than, um, than the um, medial atrial vein. So that's your, that's your limit. Once you get to the medial atrial vein, you're actually looking right down the aqueduct uh, with an oblique angle with the microscope. Um, so it's, it's, pretty, it's a pretty view, actually. Now, uh, Ralph Dacey uh, at St. Louis Wash U, um, came up with a proposal for a risk score for colloid cysts, uh, which I kind of like, and uh, it relates to an analysis of uh, incidental and symptomatic colloid cysts, looking at differences like age, whether or not the patient had headaches, cyst, cyst volume, you can see was significant, headache was significant, um, T2 signal or flare signal was also important, uh, and then the so-called risk zone, which was slightly different than our anatomic considerations. But here's the axial diameter, and you can see symptomatic patients tended to have bigger uh, cysts. And if hydrocephalus was present, the cysts were usually bigger. Uh, this was his classification of risk zones, so kind of like mine, but it is, he was using the mass intermedia as a, as a, um, a risk divi or zone divider, but you can coagulate and divide the mass intermedia. I'm not aware that there's any problem with that. And then he used uh, uh, point scores for age, headache, um, diameter of cyst, flare hyperintensity, and then risk zone, and uh, showed that patients who were symptomatic uh, tended to have higher scores than um, um, patients that didn't, and patients who had hydrocephalus also had higher scores. So he recommended using this as a decision-making point in discussing uh, with patients uh, the recommendations for treatment. So, um, my summary on colloid cysts is that um, I don't use endoscopic methods anymore uh, because it just takes too long. Um, uh, we had a, a one time a, a young uh, guy in his 50s who was a um, financial guy who got sick at work on a Friday, developed headaches, nausea, vomit, was a little bit drowsy, like eyes open to voice, following commands, a little confused, had hydrocephalus. We put an EVD in him. Um, uh, in the um, operating room on Friday night and um, made a small linear incision and not a problem. And then we came back on, I came back on Saturday morning. Uh, the residents were rounding and the, the OR called for the patient. So I said, I'll just go down and do it. And it was an hour and 12 minutes to get the cyst out with that transcortical transventricular approach. Uh, the patient had a good recovery. So um, the summary of, of, of considerations is the size of the colloid cyst, whether it occupies zone one at all, by itself, two or three. Uh, if the patient's younger, you tend to be more um, interested in doing a complete resection of the cyst wall. So zone one and younger, you have an option of endo versus transcortical transventricular, but you heard my preference. Zone two and three, when they're big, you got to do it open. 
Zone one, if they're older, you can do an endoscopic method. So somebody in their 80s, uh, I aspirated a colleague cyst. The post operative scan looked great. One year later, the cyst was back. It looked like I never did anything. So we took that patient back and did the open maneuver and everything worked fine. Uh, but for older patients, you can default when it's a small cyst if they have hydrocephalus to doing this. One thing you have to do if you're using endoscopic methods is don't you must not forget to do a septostomy, meaning make a hole in the uh, septum uh, behind and above the septal vein so there's communication between the ventricles. And then for zone two and three older, you got to do an open. I think there's evidence to support both open and endoscopic uh, strategies. It's all class three data, no prospective randomized trial. They're all reviews of the literature. Um, I think we really need to do a neuropsychological assessments on these patients if we have the opportunity pre and post. Uh, neurosurgeons don't do that. It's, it's practically difficult because usually symptomatic patients get admitted through the ER and then you have no way to do the neuropsych testing on an elective basis in, in the psychologist clinic. Um, so we, we, we should, ideally, we'd like to do it before and then after to see whether or not we're having any effect. And uh, re scanning the patients with a functional and structural uh, imaging study like we can do with Omniscient might be um, another alternative. And, um, you know, one of the provocative things is um, if it takes, it takes much less time to do this open than it does fiddling around with an endoscope and then deciding that you need to do it open, basically doubles the time. Recurrence rate is higher with endoscopic methods. Um, so um, it's, um, it's still debatable, but here you can see the example of from a, a neurosurgeon in Belfast who wrote an editorial response to the um, uh, paper out of Barrow using the trans uh, colossal approach. Here's, this is a centimeter. So his opening is about 12 millimeters and that's how he takes them out with a open technique. So anyway, that's it. Any questions? Um, so, so, um, thank you both for the presentation, Ron. Um, this is Dahlia. I, I missed uh, part of it because of two stroke alerts, but uh, it, uh, two questions. What's the uh, name of the vascular person that you use in Tampa for these cases? And the other one is, I don't know if these presentations are recorded and we can look at them later. They are. They, can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Yeah, they are. The vascular doctor... Um, I'll give you offline uh, um, okay. and I'll send that to your, I'll text you with that information, but I've used them for a couple cases, <clears throat> the venous, the venous uh, thromboembolism case. Um, okay. And he, the, and he did excellent. Um, so this is a really good surgeon and I'll, I'll just text you that offline. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Matt Hall asked me if there's any effect on endocrine function. The answer is no because this is essentially an extra axial tumor, right? It's not within the brain substance. Um, it's um, arising from the roof of the third. So you'd have to, it's not like a craniopharyngioma where there's a lot of edema in the brain adjacent to the wall of the ventricle. Um, the colloid cysts usually don't do that unless they're huge. Um, so the answer is no. If the patient has a giant colloid cyst, like one of the last cases I did before I came here was, uh, was a huge, the biggest colloid cyst I've ever seen. And it was in a, um, uh, a Portuguese gentleman from the Azores who was a fisherman back there. And then when he moved to San Francisco, he stayed a fisherman and he had a giant thing. And we checked his endocrine status pre uh, and basically he was a hypothyroid uh, a little bit, but that was it. Um, so the answer to endocrine dysfunction is there is none. All right, so um, let's take a few minutes break and then we'll go on to our uh, visiting professor, Feroz from UCSF, who God bless him has gotten up at uh, five o'clock in the morning live to give his talk and we'll give you a chance to uh, grab your coffee and come back in a few minutes and i see Feroz is on there hi Feroz. so all right thank you all right so it's eight o'clock uh, there are 37 attendees and uh, we're going to get started i'd like to introduce uh Feroz terapore who's an associate professor in the department of neurological surgery at ucsf
uh, I was involved in his training. Uh, he, he doesn't, maybe he knows this, but maybe he doesn't, but I know it. He has a distinction of having the highest written board scores of any resident who trained at UCSF during the time that I was there. He was 99.6% correct on his multiple choice exam. So um, uh, great surgeon, um, interested in transcranial magnetic stimulation. For us, we're, we're very interested in that. Here we have a MagVenture system. We have a uh, uh, NextStim system also, which uses image guidance. And uh, Feroz's recent publications include uh, data about both um, transcranial magnetic stimulation and uh, trauma because he works at San Francisco General. Uh, in 2021, his papers included repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation as therapy in infant and epilepsy of partialis continua case report morbidity and mortality of surgery for traumatic brain injury in geriatric patients, a study of over 100,000 patients, and that was published in neurosurgery. Uh, third paper was arterial venous malformations of the optic apparatus, systemic literature review and report of four cases, a very rare phenomenon. And then uh, fourth um, in 2021 was navigated transcranial stimulation mapping of the motor cortex for preoperative diagnostics in pediatric epilepsy. And uh, the topic for his presentation today is functional mapping, functional mapping with navigated transcranial magnetic, magnetic stimulation. So Feroz, thank you for getting up so early and uh, offering to present for us today. Of course, thank you for giving me the opportunity. It's really great to see your face. It's been a long time. Uh, <laughs> It's a, it's a slim shadow of being uh, able to be there in person, but um, mm -hmm. I am uh, I'm happy that we get to do it uh, at all, even if it's online. So thanks everyone for, uh, for inviting me. Thanks very much, Dr. McDermott. Um, and so today I'm gonna talk to you about uh, TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation. I'm, I'm glad to hear that you have a uh, a, uh, a Nextim system, as well as the as well as the MagVenture system. Um, most of the um, of the data that I'm going to talk about today is going to have to do with uh, that which is collected on the Nextim system. So uh, the vast majority of our uh, of our data is collected on that system. Uh, we do have a couple of others, but the image guidance on that system really makes it uh, an exceptional tool for neurosurgeons. Um, can I just ask you to confirm that I'm sharing the correct screen here? Does it show my slides there? Yeah, we see the whole uh, screen, one slide. Perfect, excellent. We do not see presenter view. Okay, all right. So um, objective today is really to give everyone an understanding of the methodology of TMS. Uh, for uh, all of its various neurosurgical applications. Um, that includes language mapping uh, and motor mapping. And then towards the end, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, the applications for uh, pediatric epilepsy, which has become uh, also an interest of mine and has started to show some promise. So really quickly, the mechanism uh, by which TMS works um, is that of induction. So essentially what we have is a, uh, an electromagnetic coil. Uh, it's typically a figure of eight winding of copper wire. Um, it's about eight inches on its long axis and about three and a half inches on its short axis. Uh, that's attached to a very large capacitor which is charged up with electricity and then discharged through the coil. Uh, when the electricity is discharged through the figure of eight coil um, by the principles of induction and the right hand rule, which some of you may remember, I, I had to look it up again. Um, essentially, the, uh, the, the winding is able to create a magnetic moment, the, uh, the center of which is located at the cross of the figure of eight winding. So um, by marrying that with a, uh, a stealth machine or a brain lab machine, an image guidance system of some sort, uh, and by um, registering the patient before one does the, the transcranial magnetic simulation, uh, you can actually achieve a temporary, a temporary lesioning effect that's extraordinarily accurate, you know, within a, a millimeter or so of, uh, of what the image guidance is telling you. So it's really a powerful tool in the right hands 
um, because we are used to using image guidance and we're used to navigating things in real time. And uh, it gives us the ability to interact with the, with the brain, with the nervous system uh, in a non-invasive fashion and in a temporary fashion. So this was the paper that started it all off uh, about uh, 30 years ago. Um, Dr. Uh, Alvaro Pascual Leone, who's a, who's a legend in, in transcranial magnetic stimulation, uh, he was the first to show that we could use uh, TMS to induce uh, uh, speech arrest and counting errors um, using short pulses of TMS, short pulses of, uh, of TMS. Uh, the temporary lesion effect was established with this paper, and uh, this is really where the interest came from for developing the technology um, as an adjunct to intraoperative mapping. Uh, this was the most recent paper, or I should say the, the, the start of the most recent era, about 20 years later, uh, after TMS was merged with a frameless stereotactic navigational system. Um, at this point, it became clear that we would be able to identify exactly which points we were stimulating and uh, possibly transfer that information to uh, uh, intraoperative navigation and get a sense of what the speech map might look like uh, in the preoperative uh, time period. So this is an example of a map uh, that was generated here. Uh, you can see um, this is going to be sort of the, the uh, format for a lot of the pictures I'm going to show. So I'm just going to explain what, I'm, what we're looking at here. So this is a three-dimensional model of the, of the patient's uh, MRI. Uh, here we've rotated it so that the, you can see the patient's left ear. They're facing to the left side of your screen. Um, and each of the orange points here uh, corresponds to one discharge of the TMS coil. And when we go back and analyze the data, uh, looking at the actual speech errors that were induced uh, as a result of these discharges, we can then create this kind of a heat map where we show a color coding of error types. So for example, red here would be speech arrest, yellow is an anomia, and then green is a uh, paraphasic error. Uh, here's another example, this cloud of points kind of over that left front of, front of temporal area and the corresponding um, speech erroring map that we generate. So beyond just speech arrest, which is really the most rudimentary form of language mapping, uh, we wanted to then take it a step further and uh, utilize some of the tasks that we use more commonly in the OR. Uh, so we started looking at whether we could do picture naming, um, which is really one of the most commonly used intraoperative speech mapping tasks. Uh, so here we have uh, the first article showing uh, that language mapping with, uh, with picture naming was also possible. And as we got more and more indications that this was going to work, we started uh, trying to fine tune and, and really hone down uh, just how good our maps were by comparing them to uh, intraoperative mapping. And I'll, I'll get to a little of that data later. Um, we found that by varying some of the uh, parameters of the stimulation, namely the uh, interval between presentation of the picture and onset of the stimulus, we could optimize the, uh, the whole protocol and, and make the maps a little bit more accurate. And uh, this was the paper that showed that we got a better uh, map by starting the TMS pulses at the same time as presenting the picture, rather than waiting a, a short delay of 300 milliseconds uh, as we were doing before. So as it became increasingly clear that the, uh, uh, the NTMS language mapping was going to be helpful, we started looking at whether we could use it to identify seed re regions also for, uh, for performing fiber tractography. 
So uh, for institutions that do um, anterograde fiber tracking or starting at the cortex and then uh, uh, kind of following the fibers downwards towards the brainstem, uh, it's really helpful to have highly accurate seed regions from which to start the tractography mapping. Uh, and what we did here was look and see at uh, on the left front of temporal region, if we use the TMS uh, uh, language map to generate the seed regions, uh, which would then be used to generate the tractography. And you can see here in purple, these were the sites that were used to generate the, the, uh, the fiber tracks. Uh, you can see that we were able to uh, generate a tractography that really nicely defines the relationship between the, the, the subcortical tracts and the tumor. So here you can see the tumor in orange and uh, the relationship of the tracts to the tumor uh, uh, posteriorly there. Subsequently in this study by, by Rafa and his colleagues, uh, they took a slightly different approach using um, essentially the, the Western aphasia battery uh, as a gold standard to determine the accuracy of preoperative TMS and uh, uh, compare that essentially with intraoperative in, uh, direct cortical stimulation. So they demonstrated a really good correlation between preoperative navigated uh, repetitive TMS and uh, also with uh, so correlating that with the post-operative deficit, um, as was the theme at that time, and as kind of continues to be the, the theme, uh, they showed a, an extraordinarily high sensitivity, um, but a somewhat less than uh, stellar specificity. So the sensitivity in this paper for identifying language positive sites was about 100%. It was about 99%. Uh, the specificity, on the other hand, was around about 55 or 60 percent. So what does that mean? It means that you're highly likely with this type of technique to find uh, all of the language sites that are relevant to a certain patient's map, uh, but you're probably going to find a lot of extra ones as well. And that's something that we have been uh, really focusing on in the last several years to improve because uh, the cloud of points that we generate are often a little bit too extensive and too robust. And when we compare them with the intraoperative map, uh, they're really not borne out in the results. So here you can see in this tumor, this left frontal region tumor here, uh, the NTMS language points are largely posterior and uh, kind of superficial to the tumor. Um, and you can also see here that the language circuits that have been generated or the language tractography that's been generated has, uh, has revealed that the tracts are largely posterior and deep to, to, the, to the surface of the tumor. So what does this mean? Uh, it means that in a patient with this type of a map and this type of tractography, um, if the surgeon has enough confidence in the results of the TMS, uh, I think it would be reasonable to do this kind of a case asleep without doing um, awake language mapping uh, to confirm. The, uh, the fiber tractography and the um, uh, uh, usage of the TMS seed voxels has also been shown to be useful for prognostication. So uh, here we were able to show that the distance, uh, the Euclidean distance between the fiber tracks here and uh, the tumor, which is here, uh, is able to predict the likelihood of having a post-operative deficit. So uh, in this paper, they showed that a, a, um, a distance of greater than 11 millimeters was predictive of uh, post-operative normal function and uh, anything less than a distance of 11, of, of, sorry, of eight millimeters between the, uh, the language sites, and in this case, the arcuate fasciculus, uh, would be dem demonstrative of a higher risk of post-operative deficit. So we can also use the, uh, the results here of the fiber tracking and the TMS 
to, uh, to inform the conversation with the patient preoperatively uh, about what the, the probability of a postoperative deficit might look like. So I'm going to show you some, uh, some videos here of what we're actually doing. So this is a patient of mine here. Uh, you can see that she's got a head tracker uh, on her head. Uh, it's, it's just fixed there with a rubber band. Um, and on the bottom of the image, you'll see the, uh, the, uh, the picture that's being presented to her. So in this case, it's a bone. Uh, she's presented with, this, with, the, with the picture, and then she needs to name the article that's being presented uh, while I'm stimulating here on her uh, left side with the coil. So this is going to be the control. I don't know if you're able to hear that, but she's saying the word bone. And then this is the same, uh, the same stimulus with the, with the TMS going. And she's not able to say the word bone until after the stimulus has completed. Here's another example. Uh, the stimulus is bench. bench. And then here we are with the TMS. Bench. And you can see the hint of smile on her face as she says that because patients do realize that they're trying to speak and can't. And uh, I've done this on myself. Uh, it's quite a surreal experience um, to be rendered completely nonverbal for the period of time that the stimulation, stimulation is going. Rose, I got a question. Please. Uh, repetitive high frequency TMS is supposed to be excitatory. Yes. And, and paired or single pulse low frequency TMS is supposed to be inhibitory, but from the sound of your stimulator there, that was repetitive high frequency. Yeah, that's a, that's a great pickup. So we're going at about five hertz there for about 10, uh, 10 pulses. So okay. it's a two second, uh, two second train. And uh, you know, the reason why we're doing this uh, in this way is the, the, the lesioning effect that you get with the short burst of high frequency stimulation seems to be uh, more focal and more inhibitory in the short period of time. Right. Uh, when you do longer periods of stimulation, like over 15 minutes or 20 minutes, uh, then you start to see this one hertz and less versus 10 hertz and more kind of division. But in the short bursting time, if you really wanna just render a small area of cortex inactive, uh, we found that about five to seven hertz is a sweet spot uh, that works really well. Is that essentially hyperpolarization of the neurons? Exactly right. That's okay. exactly right. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that's really useful with this is the patients get used to the concept of the map. They get a little practice doing the, uh, the naming task. Uh, and they get to experience what speech arrest feels like um, before they actually hit the OR. And uh, a common theme um, after surgery with patients was I would ask them if uh, there was, a, you know, any, any surprises or anything that was, that was uh, particularly difficult for them in the OR. And they would say that the speech arrest was, was one of the more difficult things for them to, uh, to deal with, but uh, having done it in the preoperative uh, setting in this much safer, less stressful environment uh, made them feel uh, a lot more secure in, in the fact that the whole thing was, uh, was going to be temporary. So here we go. Uh, this is a semantic paraphasia example. So at the bottom, you see guitar. guitar. And she's saying guitar there. And then with the stim. Uh, violin. And she says, violin. Uh, violin. Here's another patient. Uh, this is a control uh, on the left side. The, the picture is a ball. ball. And then you'll see no error there when he actually has the stem. 
Here's an example of his speech arrest. Coin. So he's saying coin. coin. And then we have complete speech arrest here. And he actually is not even able to say the word for a second or two after the stim stops. This was a very interesting error that this patient had. Uh, this was an interlingual paraphasia. Uh, this patient was uh, bilingual in Tagalog and, uh, and English. So here's the map in English. So he says ball pen. And then with the stim, he says, he says pencil, which I was told, by the way, was the word for pen in Tagalog. This is a semantic paraphasia. You have a, Papes. You have a fruit at the bottom. In this case, I think it's an orange, but he identifies it as grape. Grapes. And he says juice. juice. So this was the language map that we generated for, uh, for that patient that we were just looking at. Um, and you can see here, the regions where we were able to get really reliable speech arrests uh, just at this um, inferior frontal region there. Uh, and when you compare that with the intraoperative map, you can see that there was an extraordinarily good correspondence just right here at the boundary of the fissure. You're uh, able to see where that speech arrest site was. Yeah, Furrow's question. Yes. Um, um, I'm a, that's a right temporal lobe, low grade glioma. And um, did you um, stimulate over the tumor? So, sorry, this is uh, not in left. radio. Yeah, exactly. This is an, an anatomic model, so it's left side. Yeah. yeah so, um, at the with your TMS, do you stimulate over the uh, the cortex over top of the low grade glioma, like we would do that with language mapping? We stimulate all along the surface underneath which there's tumor and see whether or not we get any speech language effects. Did you do that with TMS? Yeah, absolutely. So you can kind of see here the uh, inferior border there of the, of the map. Um, you know, just from a technical standpoint, it's really tough with TMS to get below uh, like middle temporal gyrus mm -hmm. um, because there's just a large distance between yeah. the surface of the skin here and uh, and through you know skin temporalis and uh, to get down to ITG becomes a bit of a reach. Yeah. It's also really uncomfortable for patients um, yeah. as you get more and more inferior. The temporalis muscles really kind of twitching. Uh, yeah. Sometimes you'll catch some uh, trigeminal branches. It's very uncomfortable once you get really low. So I generally tend to stop uh, mapping right around the uh, MTG is about as low as I'll try and go with my TMS map. So the takeaway from all this is that the, the maps offer a really valuable insight into the relationship between uh, the eloquent brain and whatever lesion you're trying to uh, remove. Uh, it helps identify seed voxels for fiber tractography. And it's helpful for patients to also experience the, uh, the map and the mapping process prior to undergoing it in the operating room. Uh, the technique has a really good sensitivity and negative predictive value, um, not such a great specificity or positive predictive value. Um, but what that means is that if you have a negative map over the site of your lesion, you can really be confident that uh, you haven't missed anything. All of that is to say, you should also be aware of the false positives, that the map is probably gonna be a bit more extensive 
uh, in appearance than the actual intraoperative findings. All right, great. So now I'm going to switch over and talk some about motor and motor mapping with TMS is quite a bit more established. I think it's uh, highly reproducible. It's got great uh, negative and positive predictive values. So the sensitivity and specificity are both excellent. And it's been validated across multiple groups, multiple studies, uh, hundreds of patients uh, with intraoperative direct cortical stem. So uh, in this case, this was, this was a review uh, that was published about eight years ago. And basically it looked at the error in distance between the TMS site and the cortical site. And the mean distance was about six millimeters uh, between those two um, areas. So it's overall really an excellent, uh, an excellent way of doing preoperative localization of motor function. Um, so this group here in uh, Germany, uh, led by Sandro Krieg, um, is one of our most frequent collaborators. Um, and he had uh, shown in this paper back in 2014 uh, that the pre-surgical mapping with TMS may in fact improve outcomes uh, in patients with glioma, uh, not just shorten surgical time and uh, allow the surgeon to hone in more quickly on the motor map, but actually uh, improve outcomes uh, for the patients. So here was a look at uh, some of the things that they, uh, that they compared. They looked at the overall size of the craniotomy. Uh, interesting story here. Uh, when I was looking through uh, some of their scans, some of their post-op scans from this German group, uh, because we had a uh, kind of a, a, a blinded investigator uh, that was collaborating to, to evaluate each other's scans. So I was looking at his scans and he was looking at my scans. Uh, I noticed that all of their craniotomies were square. And uh, I said, you know, Sandra, why, why are all your craniotomies square? And he said, well, all German craniotomies are square or rectangular. And I said, well, why would you do that? Uh, isn't it easier to just make a curvilinear thing that, uh, that follows the, uh, the boundaries of your incision? And he said, no, uh, when we go back and we want to calculate craniotomy size on the papers, it's much, much easier if we have rectangles because then we can just multiply length times width. I thought that was hilarious. Out, that was outstanding. Hilarious. <laughs> Uh, so um, his craniotomies were very easy to measure, and uh, um, was, he was able to show that the size of the craniotomy was in fact smaller. Uh, and then these were the uh, kind of neurofunctional outcomes uh, in the TMS group versus the non-TMS group. Uh, you can see that in the TMS group, uh, about 15% of patients had improved function uh, at three months, whereas in the non-TMS group, that number was much lower. Uh, the unchanged groups were really uh, no change. Um, and the worst groups, even though it looks a little different here, the statistics show that there wasn't any significant difference. So uh, there was a, a slightly higher fractional group that was statistically significant of patients uh, who had improvement uh, in the TMS category. Um, here, our colleagues in, in Berlin, that's Thomas Picton and his group uh, over at um, Charité Hospital, they found that pre-surgical mapping uh, did improve uh, outcomes in patients undergoing surgery for GBM. And uh, you can see here, in particular, this specific entry in the table, uh, it really showed that the rates of new permanent motor deficit uh, were um, slightly different here. And you can see that the residual tumor volume was very different. So uh, even though the, the rates of permanent new motor deficit really were statistically the same, uh, you can see that the, um, that the residual tumor volume looked much, much, much better. So I wanna show you a few cases here. Um, this was, a, this was an example here of a 32-year-old man. Uh, he had a history of left parietal um, oligoastro, uh, had a prior resection. You can see that there in the top, in the top line. Uh, 
Uh, now coming back with a recurrence on T2 flare. Um, so the TMS in this case demonstrated hand motor function, uh, which is illustrated here in red and in pink, as well as face motor, which was down here in blue. Uh, so the face motor you can see is entirely within the T2 flare recurrence. The hand uh, motor was partially just this posterior portion of it is within the recurrence. The anterior portion is actually outside the recurrence. And then this is leg here, which is entirely outside of, uh, of the recurrence. So this patient was taken to surgery uh, with the knowledge that it was likely that some portion of the tumor here in the hand region was going to be left behind. Uh, it was explained to the patient beforehand that this was likely going to be the outcome. Uh, the intraoperative map did bear out the preoperative TMS. And so the patient, uh, the patient did very well. There were no postoperative uh, worsening of function. But uh, the subtotal resection was expected, and you know I think that was helpful for the patient to know that that, that was the plan going in. As we all know, sometimes improving outcomes is as much about not operating as it is about operating. Um, in fact, it's probably more so about not operating than it is about operating. That's one of the great lessons that Dr. McDermott taught me in, in, in my training. Um, and here you can see a perfect example of that. So this was a patient that, that came in with a new, uh, a new lesion here, uh, left-sided, looks like high frontal. Uh, the preoperative map showed hand function lateral, as you would expect in the hand knob here to the lesion, um, but the the leg here, we're, we're looking at uh, tibialis anterior and um, EHL uh, leg map was entirely contained within, within the, the, the volume of the lesion. So for this patient, we elected not to take him to surgery. Um, we continue to follow him. And uh, as you'll see in a case a little bit later, uh, the expectation is that with time, he's actually going to have enough plasticity that uh, the lesion will end up being posterior to the motor fibers and the, and the, the motor system will reorganize around it. Yeah, so I would have, um, for Rose on that case. Yeah, please. Um, how old? Uh, this patient was 24. Yeah, so it, I would just based on the anatomy there, I would say that his leg motors in front and it, what did your mapping show? Well, we actually have not taken him to surgery yet, so we haven't. No, 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 no. But your problem. TMS map. Oh, that's the leg map is right in the middle here. That these points mm -hmm. that are colored in the uh, in the center of the tumor, actually just posterior to it, yeah. uh, appear to be the positive sites for leg. And did he have any weakness on exam? He, had, he did have a little bit of foot dragging. Uh huh. So, so how long did you follow him for? Well, we're continuing to follow him. The lesion actually hasn't changed in size in, in two years. So we're still mm. following him and we're mapping him. This is actually a patient uh, that I share with Dr. Berger uh, and we're just kind of bringing him back. He brings him back once a year and uh, we map him and he's uh, so far, everything seems to be stable. What's interesting is we're starting to see the, the positive sites drift anteriorly. So yeah. uh, <laughs> some of these leg motor pathways seem to be moving to outside of the tumor. Yeah, we just we just had a case that looked just like this. We didn't do TMS pre-op because we don't have, everything's not quite set up yet, but, um, and we need a neurologist or psychiatrist to supervise mm -hmm. the TMS treatments. Um, but yeah, that patient had um, everything in front of the low grade was motor positive for leg and, and the resection was about 90%. There was some lateral inferior stuff that was left behind, but, um, 
I'm surprised. And Mitch didn't want to operate on this patient. Oh, he wanted to operate on the patient, but once he once he saw the map, he said, "Let's just <laughs> let's just bring him back a little bit later and see if it changes." Uh, oh, interesting. And we wow. did that, and um, and it 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 didn't change actually, but the lesion also was exactly the same. So yeah, uh, he but, felt comfortable giving it a little bit more time. Right. So if the tumor gets, if it changes somehow, like contrast pops. Oh gosh, time. yes. I think that's. I think even if it were to increase in size. Yeah, you uh, go ahead and map yeah. drop and all that stuff. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So uh, to take it a little past just the preoperative planning uh application uh we're now looking to see how we can use it to uh use cms to risk stratify patients uh prior to surgery so uh this was a study that has had a pretty significant impact uh for those of us that do preoperative tms um what it what it uh, achieved was it identified sort of three high risk criteria that uh, were predictive of a post-operative deficit. And so these three criteria, unsurprisingly, uh, were uh, infiltration of the motor cortex and or uh, corticospinal tract. Um, that's just a imaging finding. Uh, less than eight millimeters of distance between the tumor and the corticospinal tract. Uh, and that's with uh, tractography that is uh, that is done based upon seed voxels that are gathered with TMS. And then this interhemispheric uh, ratio of uh, resting motor threshold or RMT. So I'll explain very briefly what that is. So RMT is a parameter that we collect on every motor mapping patient. Um, it is basically the minimum amount of stimulator intensity that we need in order to trigger a motor evoked potential in the patient. So everybody's resting motor threshold is a little different. Um, people's RMT will vary over the, the period of the day sometimes. So I know that mine, for example, in the morning, right after I've had my coffee is right around 34 or 35% of max stimulator output, but uh, later in the day, like maybe around 4 or 5 p.m., my RMT goes up so to about 40. Are you addicted to self-administered TMS in the uh, morning? I am not, <laughs> but I am, I am addicted to self-administered <laughs> coffee in the morning. And this is a physiological demonstration of how effective that caffeine is. <laughs> That's pretty uh, funny. It's, so uh, the, ca the caffeine reduces the threshold. Absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Great. Uh, surprisingly. And, uh, and, and even without the caffeine, uh, just time of day seems to, seems to change the threshold a bit. Uh, so the, uh, the, the normal patient is gonna have a fairly similar RMT between left and right hemispheres, um, but one can imagine with uh, a new tumor and infiltration of, uh, of corticospinal tract, uh, you can start to see differences in uh, RMT where the tumor infiltrated side is going to require more energy to get it to discharge and fire than, uh, than the normal side. So when we compare the ratio of the normal to the tumor side, uh, you start to get this number, this ratio, uh, which when greater than 110 or less than 90, I, should, I, I could rephrase that as an absolute value difference of 10% or more, uh, you start to have um, a prediction of uh, a post-operative deficit. And that's the motor response threshold. That's exactly right. Right. That's exactly right. So we've started putting this uh, this prognostic rubric into the TMS reports after we map each patient. We'll say how many uh, of these criteria that patient might um, might satisfy, and then we'll say you know they're at, at low, medium, or high risk of postoperative deficit. Do you, do you think, um, is Mitch using this frequently and Sean? Uh, they are using it in patients for whom they think it's going to be useful. We're not doing it in every patient. No, right. Whenever we have a patient that is uh, clearly there's involvement of the motor system, uh, we're, we're getting maps. Right. So when Mitch, um, when Mitch first arrived at UCSF in 97, he was doing these gigantic craniotomies for every patient, but he was collecting uh, intraoperative stimulation mapping data for the human neocortex and motor cortex sensory, et cetera. Yes. Um, then he 
you know, as time went on, he collected, published that data in the New England Journal, his craniotomies got smaller. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm wondering with the TMS, has that had an influence on how he approaches the mapping and the size of his craniotomy? Uh, well, I can't speak for him specifically, but I'll tell you that um, it's, it's rare that I have seen him go with just the TMS and- No, right, no, map. no, right, no. Um, no. He has, however, said on numerous occasions that uh, he trusts the negative map, uh, both, both the negative TMS map and the negative intraoperative map, and doesn't feel the need to extend the craniotomy largely for the purpose of a positive control. Right. Um, so I think that might be the reason why he's shrinking his craniotomies down a bit. Yeah. Does he, he doesn't use electrocorticography anymore, does he, around motor cortex? Uh, no, he does not. No. no. Only for uh, uh, speech monitoring and speech. Yeah. yeah. Mm. So here's another impactful paper that looked at TMS as a prognostic in indicator of, of recovery. Uh, again, we're looking at uh, the uh, comparison of RMT. In this case, we're, we, we were not looking at left versus right RMT. Uh, instead, they're looking at uh, preoperative and postoperative uh, RMT. So what we are looking at here is two patients, uh, one with a lesion that is very, very close to the TMS hotspot, which is in red uh, on the left side, and another patient with a different lesion, which is quite a bit further away from the TMS hotspot here. And what this group was able to do was show that, that <clears throat> when you have a distance of greater than about 10 millimeters between your TMS length or your TMS motor site and your lesion, um, that, the, uh, that the patients have significantly better uh, outcomes. And specifically, if you see a, dis a, a difference in the preoperative and postoperative uh, motor thresholds, and the patients had a close proximity motor site, uh, the likelihood of significant recovery is lower. So what does this mean? It means if you take a patient who's got a very, very close motor, motor site uh, to the operating room, you, you resect the lesion, uh, maybe you get a GTR, um, but that patient wakes up and has pretty profound post-operative uh, TMS uh, uh, reduction in TMS amplitudes, um, then the chances that they're gonna get better all the way back to normal are pretty, pretty slim. Uh, on the flip side, uh, if you take them to surgery and their post-op TMS looks good, uh, maybe even if they have a, a, uh, a significant deficit on their exam on their sort of face-to-face in-person exam on their strength. If the TMS looks good, chances are they're going to be, uh, they're going to be largely back to normal at three months. So this actually speaks to some extent to the question that, uh, that you were asking earlier, uh, Mike, the, um, the uh, usage of TMS to uh, kind of obviate intraoperative mapping for gliomas, I think nobody's quite ready for that yet. But when we were talking about taking out metastases, uh, I think we're talking about expansile lesions. Uh, they're not infiltrative. And the folks that do a lot of motor uh, TMS, I think, have gotten to the point now where we are largely comfortable taking out these lesions without intraoperative mapping if the TMS shows that the motor system is more than a centimeter away from the lesion. Um, and so here we are uh, comparing a group receiving sort of standard preoperative imaging. Uh, and uh, we did an age and gender matched control in, between those patients and those who also received uh, TMS. Uh, so we have good comparability in the TMS group and the non-TMS group across gender and age and existence of preoperative deficit, uh, histology, and uh, tumor size. Uh, 
here's a quick example of how we are able to use the fiber tracking and the uh, seed voxels to, de uh, to demonstrate the relationship between the tumor and the corticospinal tract. Uh, this is, these are some beautiful pictures that are generated actually from the brain lab suite. And you can see here in E, the lesion completely removed uh, and this patient woke up normal. So these were the results of that comparison between the TMS and the non-TMS group. Um, we had uh, significantly more uh, worsening in the non-TMS group and significantly more improvement in the TMS group. Uh, so both sides of the coin here seem to be improved by TMS. We made fewer patients worse and we made uh, more patients better. Uh, Froze, can you go back to the prior slide? Oh yeah. Now, I was going to ask you this before, but on a second slide, there's like a columnar representation of the TMS stimulation points. How is that possible? Some of them look like they're subcortical. Yeah. So when we do the, uh, when we actually do the, the stimulations, you know, the, the area of brain that is affected is really a volume and yeah. it's, it's shaped kind of like a, a funnel, like an uh -huh. upside down funnel. Um, and so, uh, even though we represent the stimulation sites as points on a cortical surface, in actuality, they're volumes. Right. And when we uh, export the data from the system, we actually have the choice of exporting it as a volume uh, or as a single point. Uh -huh. And when we export it as a volume, uh, we can then take those same volumes, plug them into the brain lab machine and ask the brain lab to use those volumes as the seed voxels for, uh, for doing fiber. Right. Training. Right. On your set, I think on your second or third slide, you had some pink yes. uh, when you were showing and it looked like they were, I, I was wondering whether those represented uh, sequential trials of the same location, just stacked up on each other, as opposed to an actual depth, because obviously the, the deepest uh, representation of that little ball is is not gray matter so it's white matter that's absolutely right uh yeah in in that case i think that slide with the pink dots uh each one was a single stimulation ah, it was okay. just represented as a stack of three. yeah okay good yep all right so um really interestingly for me now uh nowhere has the the ability to get these preoperative maps been more useful than in the pediatric population. Um, I've been uh, working with uh, Curtis uh, Augusti or August, depending on your uh, pronunciational abilities, uh, to map his preoperative pediatric epilepsy patients. And um, it comes with a lot of benefits. So, you know, the pediatric brain has a much lower seizure threshold. Um, it tends to, uh, uh, have intraoperative seizures quite a bit more frequently than the adult brain. Um, and not, uh, unimportantly, you know, most of these kids are having, having, uh, surgery because of a propensity for seizure. And so their thresholds are naturally going to be lower. Uh, so one of the great frustrations of, uh, of the pediatric epilepsy surgeon is, uh, when there's a seizure intraoperatively, uh, that has to be aborted either with propofol uh, or with some other agent. And then, um, you know, there's a Todd's paralysis post-op or post, uh, sorry, post-seizure. And the surgeon really just has to wait for uh, sometimes half an hour, an hour to uh, let that abate and uh, continue with the case. So it's really nice to be able to get uh, preoperative um, mapping on these kids because it allows the surgeon to have a pretty solid idea of what their uh, motor system is going to look like. And in the case of a seizure, sometimes it's even allowing them to proceed with surgery, um, even if the electrical signals have been, uh, have been tamped down by, by a bolus dose of propofol. Um, so uh, another issue here that, uh, that uh, is, is really salient is that these kids are often getting really high doses of anesthetic, you know, a kid will often be getting 120 or 150 of propofol 
uh, whereas you know a, a dose of 70 or 80 might knock out an adult. So um, as a result, you need to use much higher electrical uh, voltages to get uh, uh, results in the kids' uh, motor systems. Um, and then finally, the ability to use TMS to inform the preoperative discussions uh, with families cannot be overstated. Uh, as uh, we all know, um, having uh, pediatric uh, patients in the office is, is often um, particularly uh, high stress for the patients, for the parents in, especially, and the, the conversation between the parents and the, and the, and the surgeon is uh, a lot more uh, fraught uh, just because of the age and vulnerability of the patients. So we wanted to see whether there was a lower bound or, a, or a, an age below which uh, TMS was really not helpful. Um, as the brain matures, the quantity of myelin in, myelin in the neurons increases. And as a result, uh, the ability of a neuron to take on an electrical charge uh, increases uh, by, uh, by the principles of induction. Uh, and so we rely on that uh, interaction between the magnetic field and an insulated conductor in order to generate an electrical action potential. Uh, if the conductor that we're targeting is not insulated, in this case with myelin, then it will not actually have uh, the same inductive effect. Uh, so we put together our patients to, to publish the series recently. And um, you know, just looking at some of the parameters here, uh, the duration of the study was about a half hour, not terribly long. Uh, stimulus intensity, if you'll note here, was oops, sorry, was 60% of stimulator output, which is quite high for, a, for an adult, uh, average is around 30 to 40. Uh, and just look here at the E fields. Um, you know, when we're doing a map on a full grown, uh, mature human adult, uh, usually E field values are around 80 or 90, that's in volts per meter. Whereas in a kid, you're doing it at a, up around 128 with a pretty high standard deviation. So some of these kids are actually going up to like 160 or 200. So we did find that age was the most significant predictor of whether we would be successful in a study. Um, and patients three years and under really were significantly more likely to have a failed study. Uh, over the age of three, the failure rate was only about 25%. Other independent variables uh, that we looked at, you know, gender, presence of anti-epileptics, uh, type of epilepsy, region of uh, the focus of epilepsy, none of those seem to have a significant impact on the rate of failure. And this is what it looks like when we map a kid. Um, I couldn't resist throwing this in here. We have a, a five-year-old here sitting on her dad's lap. Uh, you can see there's an iPad, uh, typically with some version of Frozen playing on it. Um, and Mr. Potato Head is uh, firmly clutched in the left arm. So we take great pains to make sure that these kids are really well uh, uh, taken care of and that they're feeling comfortable through the map. So I'm just gonna end uh, in my last few minutes here with a, a, a recent case. Um, this was a 10 month old with uh, Rasmussen's encephalitis, terrible disease. Um, she had had uh, basically seizures since the day she was born, but specifically her, uh, her worst seizure semiology was this, uh, was this hand, left hand twitching that was continuous. She had EPC that affected the hand knob on the right side of her brain. So, uh, you know, it was kind of a, a, a compassionate use case. We applied for permission and we received it. Um, and we were surprisingly able to map her right hand knob here. You can see the region where we localized her, her right hand knob just here in this middle picture. And um, we then decided to try a repetitive TMS uh, therapeutic uh, protocol to try and abort her seizure. So we focused on this right hand knob. I think we did five days of stimulation, five days in a row. Uh, we did 15 minutes of an inhibitory 
uh, protocol here to try and knock down um, the function. And we, uh, we were actually able, able to achieve almost complete uh, cessation of her left hand twitching, uh, which lasted for almost uh, 10 days or 14 days after the, after the period of our treatment. Unfortunately, she had a host of other medical and uh, neurological issues and she passed away some months later. But, um, you know, to this day, I get a Christmas card from her parents uh, saying, you know, thanks for those two weeks because uh, uh, I think it made a pretty significant impact for them. So, you know, this is just a taste of, I think, some of the therapeutic applications uh, of RTMS, which we're starting to explore. Uh, maybe in a year's time, I'll come back and give a talk on some of those results because I think they're gonna be really, uh, really exciting and transformative. Um, this is just a snapshot of our mapping consensus. So this is the consensus paper, which describes uh, how uh, the mapping can be pre uh, performed, uh, best practices, kind of a consensus of all the people around the world that do this frequently. This is for both mapping of language and of motor uh, and in both patients and healthy volunteers. And so uh, what do we take away from all this? I think I would love to be able to say that uh, uh, TMS is uh, a, a good way to replace uh, intraoperative stim. I don't think we're there yet, but I think we can say that it is valuable for uh, preoperative assessment of language and uh, motor regions and how those regions associate with tumors. It's really helpful for the surgeon um, to follow cortical reorganization in real time, to follow patients over the years and see when uh, the best time for maybe a, a repeat resection uh, has come. And uh, I think it's showing a lot of promise in helping with the pre-surgical uh, management of pediatric epilepsy and perhaps we'll see, uh, may have some therapeutic benefit as well. So with that, I'll stop. Uh, thank you so much for your time and your attention, and uh, I'd love to take some questions in the last few minutes here. All right. Thank you, Feroz. Um, I got a question. Is the uh, TMS mapping is approved by FDA? Is it reimbursed? Uh, so we are seeing it be increasingly reimbursed. It's not reimbursed all the time, um, but uh, when we bill it, as uh, motor revoked potentials, like with the MEP codes, the same MEP codes that are used for uh, electrical, transcranial electrical uh, MEPs, uh, we are finding that Medicare is reimbursing us. And uh, especially in the pediatric population, uh, we're having really good luck with, uh, with payers actually reimbursing us. One of the things um, I've been most intrigued about relates to the ability um, post-injury, whether it be stroke or surgery, the ability of TMS to promote recovery by inhibiting overactive areas or stimulating underactive areas. Do you have any comments on that uh, therapeutic potential? Absolutely. So, so that's actually the, the three studies we have running right now are looking at exactly that. Over mm -hmm. at, at uh, Moffitt, we're looking at folks who've had post-operative paresis, uh, yeah. and we're doing a, uh, a, a rehab therapy uh, with and without TMS study over there. Um, here at SF General, uh, we're looking at a similar protocol for uh, patients who've had traumatic brain injury with right. uh, post-injury paresis, again, looking to see with and without uh, TMS, whether there's a difference in recovery. Right. And then uh, apart from being navigated, are you using functional MR to target areas of over and under activity or do you use no. anatomy? No, we're using, uh, we're using the TMS maps themselves. So mm -hmm. if it's an upper extremity paresis, say in the left hand, we're mapping uh, left motor area, right motor area, and then we're focusing our therapy on the functional representation of the mm -hmm. motor area. Okay. Anybody else have any questions? Yes, I do, Dr. McDermott. Uh, Bruce, that was a wonderful and informative lecture. I have a question for you regarding uh, when you're mapping the speech centers. When you showed your video on the, of the subject, it seems like you're moving the magnet several uh, inches. And I'm wondering how you get the precision down to the area of the actual um, uh, speech maps when you're moving it 
in, in that way? I mean, how do you know if you should go a few centimeters anterior or posterior, et cetera? So, so the, the beauty of the system is that um, since, it's, since it's navigated in real time, uh, regardless of where I've moved the magnet, um, the system records the location of the stimulus and, and overlays it on the MRI scan in real time. And I'm also watching on the screen as I'm moving the, the coil uh, in the same way that you would be in, in the OR you know, with, a, with a brain lab uh, a probe. Um, so, you know, it's not necessarily the case that I have to be uh, at a specific location, as long as the system is able to record where I was when the stimulus was triggered, uh, I can then go back and correlate the region of stimulation with the with whatever error took place and and generate the map in that way. Uh, the reason I move the, the, the coil around quite a bit between stimuli in a mapping case for, for language is because it's actually kind of uncomfortable for the patient to st sit in the same spot over and over again. So rather than you know march in five millimeter increments from back to front or from top to bottom, it's actually more comfortable if you have kind of a pseudo <coughs> pattern and target different spots. Uh, at the end, the result is the same, but the patient's experience is quite a bit less uncomfortable. Thank you. And, and how small is the field that you're actually stimulating? I mean, when you're stimulating, how large of a field is the stimulus, essentially? So, so the, the field is actually very large. Um, you know, you'll, you'll be able to, to measure magnetic moment in a field, something like this, maybe five or six centimeters. The actual uh, physiologically active uh, portion of the field is about the size of a dime. Um, but as you increase stimulator intensity, the area actually increases Wide. a bit. Yeah. So you do end up getting more spread when you have the stimulator intensity jacked up, which is why we really try and map at the lowest necessary intensity so we can get the highest amount of precision. Thank you. All right. Well, Feroz, thanks for getting up early. Of course, um, my pleasure. I got thanks. up. At I got up at five ten. I thought I was getting on early, but you were you beat me. So uh, it's no, it's 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 a pleasure. Uh, thanks for the invitation. I appreciate yeah. your your questions and your interest, and um, I look forward to further discussions down the line. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Rose. Thanks everybody for attending today, and uh, that'll conclude our grand rounds for this morning. Thank you. Thanks. Have a great day.